Today, I don't have my usual slide, so you're going to have to listen to me as I try and explain some concepts. And uh, these are difficult concepts, and it's made even more challenging because I uh, recently had a video uh, censored because it was considered to be misinformation. So I have to therefore try and delineate some of these scientific concepts in a way that doesn't get censored. But a lot of what I'm talking about is actually well ahead of what is understood by the scientific community. So it doesn't make sense at the moment. So you have to understand why I'm explaining this. So when I've been talking in the past about a COVID storm, spike triggered autoimmune response mechanism, I'm not referring to a cytokine storm as occurred in severe COVID-19. This is different. And what I'm trying to delineate is what is going to happen in the future. Now, that's very difficult. And this is part of the reason why I've been calling for autopsies, because in order to make sense of the science, you really need to understand exactly what is happening pathologically in the body. And without autopsies, that then gets very, very difficult. So what I'm trying to predict is difficult, and sometimes it means you have to be flexible in your direction. So when I spoke about the COVID storm in the past, my focus was primarily on macrophage activations. Macrophages are one type of immune cells, very important immune cells, but they do multiple jobs in terms of the immune system. They're bigger cells, they can swallow up particles, viruses and bacteria, destroy them. They can also be antigen presenting cells. They can do multiple things at many times. And my focus has been primarily on these cells as the driver for the COVID storm. And the COVID storm is primarily in those people who have been immune primed and then get exposure to infection. It's kind of like what happens in a challenge study. So in a challenge study, when they're doing it say on animals, they would vaccinate the animals then what they would do is they would then take the, the virus they vaccinated against, and then they would put that, um, make them get exposed to it. And then once exposed to it, they would try and understand the pathology on re-exposure. The reality is that when they did it with SARS-CoV, they ran into a few problems when they looked at the immune response after the challenge study. And so at the time in 2012, they recognized that we had to be cautious with regards to some of the vaccine candidates that were used for SARS-CoV, right? This is not SARS-CoV-2. But the question is, is there a similar extrapolation when you look at SARS-CoV-2? Now, the only way we will know this is through autopsy. And you can see that it seems that there is a battle tooth and nail. They just don't want this to be done. And as a result, we are blind. And so what you have to then do is try and take what little scraps of details you have to try and put it together in a picture. In that sense, as I said, when it came to the COVID storm, my prediction is that it's primarily macrophage activation. But I had a recent presentation with uh, Dr. Uh, Deneligan, who was a pathologist, and he mentioned something that made me go back to 2021. And he mentioned the autopsy reports from Professor Arnie Burkhardt. He's a German pathologist, and he was doing important research on COVID um, early in the pandemic. So he was one of the early people who in April, May of 2020, were publishing autopsy reports on COVID to try and help us to understand it. And similarly, what then happened in 2021 
he continued to do autopsies, but he was looking specifically at also what happens in the vaccinated cohort. At the time, his research was not well appreciated. It was therefore not published in a peer review paper, but he did publish it in a PDF document for us to be able to look at. And so in effect, what has happened is that that research has been discounted. And as a result, even I forgot about that important research. So after the conversation, I went back to look at the document to try and see if I could understand a little bit more about what was happening in terms of that pathological change. What he noticed was that he did 15 autopsies. So he was looking at up to 15 candidates who had um, were having autopsies. And 14 of them actually, no, actually, when you look at the, the paper, I think all 15 had lymphocytic infiltrates around the blood vessels, what we call perivascular infiltrates. Now, the, the importance of this, now this can happen in normal circumstances. So it's not necessarily um, always a pathological sign, but it's always a sign of inflammation because these lymphocytes that usually accumulate a blood, around blood vessels don't do this in regular circumstances. It's usually in the context of inflammation. And so a vasculitis means that it is an inflammation of blood vessels, okay? The problem with a vasculitis is that very often we see the presentation quite late. People may have symptoms of being tired, um, uh, so they'll have fatigue, maybe some fevers, sometimes muscle aches, pains, joint pains, and sometimes it can be years before a diagnosis is made. So autoimmune-driven vasculitic conditions are very serious, and we do look for them, and they're very difficult to manage as well. But when I looked back at the autopsy, I realized that in almost every case, at least 14 out of the 15, or at least 15 out of the 15, he noted that they had perivascular infiltrates in the organs, in heart, in some in liver, in lungs. And that very strongly points to a vasculitis, inflammation of the blood vessels. So my question therefore is, now the fact that this was done on autopsy studies suggests that these people died. And it would then tie in with what we've also been seeing with regards to abnormal clots. Because if you have inflammation of the blood vessels, you are more likely to have clotting occurring in those blood vessels. And that's one of the things we've been looking at when we we notice what the embalmers have seen. I predicted it's some kind of autoimmune response is my thought as to the mechanism. But the main issue is that if we are having vasculitis occurring, where you're having inflammation of the blood vessels, which is subclinical, meaning that many people don't know that it is there, we are very, very blind if we don't have autopsies. Because we, we don't know who is necessarily being affected. And what then happens is that technically when you have a vasculitis, you're weakening these blood vessels and you're causing, you're increasing the risk of inflammatory responses, which can then speed up plaque disease. And so from most vasculitic conditions, you will end up with an increased risk of heart, brain, kidney kind of pathology. And this is therefore going to present very as a word I would describe, is more of a storm surge than a tsunami. Cases, you will just keep on hearing more and more people getting sick, unusual conditions, not quite making sense, no clear run-in with regards to their symptom. That is the expectation that I have based on those early pathological reports. Now, you have to remember people will discount what has been said by say Professor Burkhardt because sadly he had passed away and so therefore he was unable to continue this work 
and um, it got such negative press. I remember even the in the the government in Germany came out and said that they disagreed with what he said. And I'm thinking this is pathology. He is telling you exactly what is seen. It's not even his opinion. So anyone can go back to the pathology, look at the histopathology and make their own judgment. But if you are seeing perivascular infiltrates, that very strongly points to a vasculitis. So here is therefore my extrapolation. When you have exposure to spike protein, and I'll not specify source, and important to know, this is also part of what I look for in the COVID storm, is actually infection. But it's infection on top of immune priming. So the ideal template to have studied this would have been somewhere like New Zealand. Because in New Zealand and Australia as well, because they shut down their borders, they therefore largely kept COVID out of the population. So therefore they had a COVID naive population. They then did extensive vaccination across the population. And this was in preparation for the fact that they knew they had to open up. They then opened up to the Omicron wave and they still had a surge in deaths, but that was the perfect template of a challenge study where you had immune primed the individual, you then expose them to the virus, and you therefore want to try and understand what are the pathological changes that occurred when any of them had even severe COVID-19. You'd want to know, is the mechanism of disease exactly the same, where you see microclotting with quite significant inflammatory changes in the lungs, what happens in the kidney, what happens in the heart. That's the kind of pathology that we would have wanted to know, and that wasn't actually done in great detail. Then you also want to know, because that's one cohort who may have severe COVID-19, but even in the cohorts who don't, is exposure to the virus triggering immune responses that could cause severe problems down the line? Do they have more myocarditis? Do they have more kidney inflammation? These are all the kinds of questions that we should, under normal circumstances, want to try and analyze. As usual, what is happening now is that the science is no longer able to be done in a pure way because no one wants to be the first to say there may be a problem. And as a result, the science, I shouldn't say it's not necessarily being done, it's not being published. So I suspect it's quite possible because we're curious as from a scientific medical point of view, I can't imagine that people haven't done these autopsies looking at the tissue and trying to understand some of the pathological changes. But they will know that even if they saw something that was very strange, they may not be able to publish it because it could have a direct impact not only on them personally, but on their institution and their funding. And as a result, we don't have answers. As I said, it doesn't really matter what my opinion is. All that really matters is that we have done appropriate research. So the fact that I have concerns based on what had happened in the past doesn't mean that there is a problem. But if it hasn't adequately been studied and investigated, I don't see how anyone can be sure there isn't a problem to come down the line. COVID is still circulating and it's still circulating very highly. And one of the big challenges is that very often the symptoms are extremely mild. Patients barely know that they have had an infection. And so therefore the assumption is that because the infection symptoms at the time are mild, 
they presume that therefore the implications are unlikely to be serious. As I said, if we took that approach to HIV, the symptoms after someone has been infected with HIV are very mild, very subtle. But we know we still need to look for the fact that virus is there because it will it will indicate what is going to happen down the line. That's how we should be approaching COVID. But we have fatigue, fatigue in the scientific community, fatigue, COVID fatigue in the, in the medical community. We definitely have COVID fatigue in the population. People don't want to hear about it anymore. They want it to be passed. They're fed up with it. They're not taking any more boosters, but they just want to get back to normal. And that's okay. The problem is, is that similar to hypertension, vasculitis is silent and dangerous. So if it is occurring, we should be using every method available to try and understand who is affected and how can it be mitigated. That should be the approach that's taken. At the moment, the way how we are handling COVID, if we did the same thing with hypertension and left hypertension untreated, unsolved, no intervention for five to 10 years, even if you then made the diagnosis 10 years later, the kidney damage is done, the eye damage is done, the heart damage is done, the brain vascular damage is done, it can't be reversed. Everything in medicine is about mitigation. That's how we approach it. Early diagnosis, early mitigating me uh, mechanisms, that's how we try and reduce the complications in the long run. This is not being done with COVID. And whilst we may hope that there are no issues down the line, hope has never been the approach of science. Everything is about risk mitigation. We don't hope that you'll be fine if you have hypertension. We check it, we look for it. If you have a family history or at a certain age, you look for it. That's why you have your, your blood pressure done. In the same way, we should also be looking for issues around COVID. As I said, I understand the fatigue. I'm interested, I'm trying to find answers. But many people don't want to know. But does that mean that we should not look? Does not mean that we shouldn't be in searching, trying to find solutions, trying to make a way forward? Because at the end of the day, if there are issues and they hit us down the line, as with most aspects of medicine, if there has been no action early, very often there's very little that can be done. So the main point is that based on the autopsy findings, looking back from what Professor Burkhardt had done, and the fact that in almost every case that he looked at in those 15 cases, they all had perivascular infiltrates, I don't know how we cannot presume that vasculitis inflammation of the blood vessels is not a critical aspect of what is going on beyond people getting an infection. That may explain why so many complications occur of sometimes three to six months after an infection. Needs to be acknowledged, needs to be solved. We need to find solutions, not in five years time, but tomorrow, actually today. Thank you.